And so here we were trying this thing that was entirely different, that flipped the script on a lot of what people said worked about online learning. And from the first session, Hmm. it was like digital sparks were flying. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. We talk a lot about online courses on the Gold Digger podcast. After all, online courses play a major role in my business, and they've changed my life completely. We've talked about mini courses, signature courses, how to build, sell, and automate your course. But maybe the structure of the courses we talk about doesn't quite fit the topic or the idea that you have. Maybe you need a different kind of online course for what it is that you want to teach. Have you ever heard of a cohort? Wes Kao helped create the modern cohort-based education movement with Seth Godin. Now she's taking the category she helped create to the next level with her new startup, Maven, the world's first digital platform for cohort-based courses. Cohort-based courses combine live workshops, videos, articles, and projects to create impactful learning experiences. It's about students learning from each other and by doing. I am so excited to explore this different kind of online course and learn from Wes myself. If an online course is on your heart and mind, this is your episode. Let's dive on in with Wes Ko. I've been taking tons of walks with Baby Quinn lately, and it's always a great time for podcasts. Thankfully, I've got a ton of new shows to listen to from the HubSpot Podcast Network, just like My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Purry. My First Million features famous guests, digs into how companies made their first million, and brainstorms new business ideas based on the hottest trends and opportunities in the marketplace. They've covered topics like why the next big social media network will be on the blockchain, companies of one that make millions, and three patterns for great business ideas. Listen to My First Million and all the HubSpot Podcast Network shows wherever you get your podcasts. Wes, welcome to the Gold Digger podcast. I am so excited for our conversation today. Super excited to be here, Jenna. So I want to know, let's dive on in. I want to know what your early career looked like. Like, how did you get to where you are today? And then kind of paint us a picture of what you're doing these days. Yeah, my early career was at the Gap headquarters in San Francisco. Okay. Right out of college, I did a rotational program there where over the course of about a year, they rotated a group of about 15 of us through Banana Republic, Old Navy, Gap in the key retail functions of merchandise planning, merchandising, production, supply chain. So it was this incredible experience and high level overview of what it takes to make a company like The Gap, which had been around for 40 years at that time, really run. So I credit a lot of the business fundamentals that I learned to that rotational training program where you know, even today, a lot of the analytical skills that I learned there, a lot of the consumer behavior principles that I learned there, I still use in my daily work now. I like to joke that I started off at a big company and went progressively smaller with every <laughs> company that I went to thereafter. <laughs> so, you know, I was at a couple other retail and beauty companies and then made the move over to a tech startup that eventually got acquired by Snap, i.e., Snapchat. And then I moved from San Francisco cross country to New York to work with Seth Godin, the marketing wow. author who's written 18 best selling books. And, you know, that was a, a really big shift. That was my first step into the world of education and into online learning. And Seth and I ended up starting the Alt MBA together, which really kicked off this entire category of cohort based courses. So the Alt MBA was one of the first cohort based courses that was mainstream and popular with a bunch of working professionals that are now taking cohort based courses that have since popped onto the scene. And 
that was my first foray into really thinking hard about assumptions that were being made at the time about online learning. One of my first projects when when starting to work with Seth was creating a Udemy course for him. Hmm. And we were spending so much effort putting together this amazing curriculum, recording these amazing videos. And in the process of researching MOOCs, massive open online courses, these evergreen self-paced courses, I realized that the completion rate was super low. Mm-hmm. It was anywhere right between 7 to 10%. And there was a recent MIT study that said that completion rates were as low as 3 to 6%. Yeah. So it was just insane that you know, so many amazing creators and instructors are creating MOOCs, these video-driven courses, and so many students were optimistic at signing up for these courses with this, with the dream of learning and changing their lives and transforming themselves and having access to the best education, when in reality, a tiny percentage of people who signed up for these courses actually stayed long enough to even learn anything. Hmm. Isn't that wild? That statistic is something that we fixate on as a brand because we're like, how do you make it easier? How do you guide them on the journey? How do you follow up? Because that statistic is really sad, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to know, just out of curiosity, what was it like going from these big corporations to working with an entrepreneur with a totally digital and different brand than what you had known? That's a great question. I haven't talked about this as much publicly, but I love this question because literally up until I worked, started working with Seth Godin, I didn't realize that being a freelancer and being a small business owner was even a viable career path. Like I knew, you know, in my town, there were, you know, shops on the main street and, you know, there's, there, you know, had to be people doing things on the internet, but it just didn't feel like a viable career path for people like me. Like it felt like, oh, if you were, you know, a respectable person and you wanted to be quote unquote successful, you had to work at a big company whose brand name that everyone recognized and right. And like, that's how, that's how you knew that you had made it. And when I started working with Seth, it was like this whole new world opened because most of his audience, a lot of them are small business owners and freelancers. There's contractors, there's solopreneurs or entrepreneurs. And it was amazing meeting so many incredible entrepreneurs who were doing their own thing. And in many ways, I'd felt when I was at bigger companies that there was something wrong with me, that I was mm-hmm. defective in some way because I would challenge the way that we were doing things, or I'd want to take action, or I'd want to switch things up and, and try different ways of you know improving whatever our baseline was. And my managers, not everyone, but you know, half the managers, I would say, would kind of finger wag and poo poo and just be like, no, like, stop trying to make a ruckus. Like, let's just keep on keeping on, Mm -hmm. like, stop trying to run when we're doing fine walking. And so I'd always felt like there was something wrong with me in the workplace and that my brain just like needed to change in some way to like get with the program. And when I started working with Seth, that's when I realized that this personality trait of mine that challenges things and wants to improve things and wants to dive in and take action was actually a feature and not a bug. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. That's incredible. What did it look like? So you've kind of brought up this idea. You're pursuing this education. You're looking at the way things have been done and recognizing that there's this big gap of completion rates, people being able to follow through, people getting results. Where did you take that research and how did you kind of create a new way? Well, Seth Godin and I basically started kicking around some ideas. And the first place that we started was, what if we literally did the opposite of what evergreen self-paced courses do? So instead of a course being $20 to $30, pretty affordable, low cost, or even free for a lot of online learning at the time, you know, what if we made a course that was expensive enough that students felt like they had skin in the game? And felt Mm -hmm. like they needed to show up in the same way that if you make an appointment with a personal trainer, you feel more compelled to show up. 
Yes. And what if instead of it being a solo activity where you're basically watching a bunch of videos on your own in your room, you instead did a course with a cohort of other like-minded students and learned alongside other people that were similarly inspired and on a similar journey? And what if instead of it being mainly a passive experience watching these videos, just basically passive content consumption, what if instead a course were about hands-on learning and active participation, that instead of just sitting in and reading or sitting and watching videos, that you had to discuss with a group, that you had to put together a pitch, that you had to actually pitch it and get feedback and critique from the group around you. And there were coaches supporting you along the way and you, you know, instead of just learning about a concept, actually had to put it into practice. And so we, we thought about doing the opposite of what self-paced courses were at the time. And it seemed pretty wonky. It seemed really, really out there. And it's funny because people now look at cohort-based courses and think, well, that was so inevitable. Like that was so mm-hmm. obvious that we had to go in that direction. But looking back, this was 2015, you know, Zoom wasn't very popular. People, you know, didn't really know how to use it. Slack was just just coming onto the scene as something that was more mainstream. So a lot of people were suspicious about these online tools and just about meeting strangers online and yeah. with people, <laughs> you know, that you've never met. And so this was a giant experiment. And I personally was kind of skeptical in the beginning. You know, Udemy, Coursera, Skillshare, these were really the dominant modes of learning for not just at the time, but the past 10 years have really been dominated by that format. And so here we were trying this thing that was entirely different, that flipped the script on a lot of what people said worked about online learning. And from the first session, the first workshop, about 75 people were in our first cohort in 2015 in the spring. From the first time that people got together on Zoom, it was incredible. Hmm. It was like digital sparks were flying and students were connecting with each other outside of the channels that we had set. They were DMing each other. They were hopping on Zoom calls without us. They were doing the projects that we had created for them, but also partnering up and working on side projects together. And within a month, we were hearing that our alumni who had just graduated, it was was a four-week course, were attending each other's weddings, that they were staying at each other's houses when someone was flying over Cincinnati or someone else was flying over London or someone else was flying over Singapore. They would hit each other up and, and stay at each other's houses. And alumni were hiring each other to work at each other's companies. And it was just this beautiful community that had come together that completely challenged what online learning was. And oh yeah, one other thing, you know, most people expect there has to be an expert, right? Because usually Mm -hmm. learning is the sage on stage model, even starting in K through 12, it's the teacher standing in front of the room and everyone else sitting silently taking notes. If you think about college, it's basically that way, except in lecture halls. And then if you think about a lot of evergreen self-paced courses, it's that way too, except now on video, that expert is on video talking at you. So the other thing about the Alt MBA that was pretty wild was Seth Godin himself never showed up in the course. Okay, tell me this. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, so it's it's pretty wild. When we told people that in the beginning, they basically mutinied, just saying like, how can that be? How can you be charging thousands of dollars and I don't even get to meet my hero? Like, I don't even get to ask him questions and and get his advice personally. Like, what is this madness? And But that's, that's what it was. We had designed this four-week course so that the whole point of doing this course was to get the hands-on practice mm-hmm. that most of the time we skip over if we're left to our own devices. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like reading nonfiction books where at the end of every chapter, there's you know exercises or a couple questions and the author's like, you know, go through these questions, apply it to yourself. And if you're anything like me, I skip those and just continue reading yep. because it's more fun to continue reading. Yep. And I don't have to do as much brain work to stop and actually go through those exercises. So what we wanted the Alt MBA to be was entirely focusing on on that hands-on piece. And we explained that, you know, you think that if you get to talk to Seth Godin, that you're going to ask him a question, he's going to give you this 
guru-like silver bullet of an answer <laughs> and it's going to solve all of your problems, but that's not the case. That's not going to yeah. happen. It's, it's, it's just not true. Like if you, if you met with Seth, he wouldn't tell you anything that you couldn't already find from some of his talks online, from his content online. And yeah. so we don't want to do a course where it's basically more people thinking that what they need is a guru telling them what to do. Yes. Yes. We wanted to have a program that was all about empowering entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, innovators, change makers, empowering them by coming together and introducing them to other people around the world who are doing amazing things, who are on a similar path, who are facing similar challenges, and create the infrastructure, the sandbox, where through a series of projects multiple times a week over the course of a month with this course narrative arc that we had designed and coaches that we had trained, that we would create this bubble where entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and innovators could come together into this bubble for a month, really push themselves to the brink and come out emerging from the other side, a changed and better leader. Wow. This is so interesting. And here's the thing. I was thinking of all the objections in my head, Wes, of like, okay, at this time of my life, I understand this, but as the creator, I cannot show up and facilitate these things or, you know, help these things. And I think a lot of times when people go the more evergreen route, whether it's as a teacher or a student, they're looking for that time freedom or that choice freedom, which then can obviously impact their level of results. So walk me through how you built this where Seth wasn't required, because I think a lot of course creators are building courses so that they can do the one to many without trading their time for money. And so my objection meter was going off until you said that Seth didn't have to show up. Tell me more about this. Yes, it's definitely a possibility for course creators to do a core-based course and minimize the amount of time that they are spending on their course. I will say that the format that we had in the Alt MBA with Seth Godin is more extreme. So if you're a first-time course creator I don't recommend starting there because we had to do so much more work to create a format where Seth didn't have to be involved than if a creator is willing to be involved. You know, if you have a, a two week course and you lecture on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so four times over the course of two weeks, if a creator is willing to show up and do Q and A's or do live workshops, that makes it much easier to set up their course. So mm -hmm. eventually, I definitely see more creators moving in the direction of the Alt MBA, where the creator themselves don't have to be there, but there are very well-trained, skilled facilitators who are very familiar with the person's content and the projects and breakouts and interactive exercises are designed in such a tight way that the creator doesn't have to be there. But for first-time course creators, I recommend being there and showing up mm -hmm. and, and designing that course in a way where it's still highly leveraged for you and it's still a good use of your time, but you are still involved. I love that. I think that's so great. If you were going to just simply explain what cohort-based education is, how would you explain that? Cohort-based courses are online courses where there's a set start and end date. And you learn with a group of students together during this set period of time. So the course might be three days, it might be three weeks, it might be three months, but over this, this period of time, you're learning with these other students. And it's a lot more interactive, it's a lot more community-driven, it's a lot more active than a self-paced video-driven course. I love that. All right, 2022, slow your roll. Q1, it flew by and it was such a different season for my business. I was on maternity leave. I announced my first book, How Are You Really? And my team and I kept the business running through another winter of uncertainty. How are you feeling after the start of the year? Are you ready to take on Q2 and really put your head down on strategies and systems for growth this year? 
Well, HubSpot is here to help you with an easy to use CRM platform that aligns your business and delivers a seamless experience for your customers. Other CRMs can be cobbled together, but HubSpot is carefully crafted in-house for businesses just like yours. Its purpose-built suite of operations, sales, and marketing tools work together seamlessly so that you and your team can focus on what really matters, your customers. With features like team email, you can turn incoming emails into tickets or send them straight into your shared inbox so no more questions can slip through the cracks. You can even take your business to go with the HubSpot mobile app. Learn how to grow better by connecting your people, your customers, and your business at HubSpot.com. I can't believe I'm saying these words, but I wrote a book. I keep thinking that the more that I say it, the more real it's going to feel, but it's truly been this surreal experience working on this massive project, especially since I said I would never do this. Never say never, right? Well, there's this amazing story behind the book, how it all came together with the encouragement of a massage therapist and seeing a mouse and how I managed to write my heart out in secrecy over the last few years. My first book is called How Are You Really? And I would love to share all of the behind the scenes with you before it's out this summer. I sincerely hope you'll join me inside of my Insiders Club so that you can take this book writing and launching journey alongside of me. You can join right now at jennacutcher.com slash book. That's jennacutcher.com slash book for the insider scoop about how are you really. I can't wait to share this book and this journey with you. I'll see you on the inside, gold diggers. One thing that I think is so powerful, and I think that is, it's a point worth noting, is if you are learning something and you know that you're either going to have to discuss or teach it to someone else, you learn it in a way more engaged way. Like, I don't know about you, Wes, but like if I'm reading something and I'm like, oh, I want to tell somebody about this, I ingest the content and like retain the content in a much greater way than if I was just passively learning it and thinking, oh, I'll get around to applying that later. Do you think that's one of the biggest reasons why cohort learning can really transform someone's experience, but also their retention and their ability to take action? Yeah, absolutely. On the learner side, we're seeing so many people get excited about taking cohort-based courses because it's way more of an engaging experience and the lessons stick with you much longer when you are interacting with that material versus just sitting there listening. So for example, if you're taking a a course on sales, if you were watching a bunch of YouTube videos on it, it's a lot easier to tune out, a lot easier to, you know, just sit there and, and pretend like you're learning without actually thinking hard about that material. Whereas if you're taking a core based course on sales, you know, instead of watching videos on how to pitch, you're actually creating a pitch and you're delivering that to a group of your fellow students and they're giving you feedback on it. They're telling you what's working, what made my eyes glaze over, what parts really hooked me in. And then you're adjusting your pitch based on that feedback and then doing it again and drilling it. Or you're writing a cold email and literally putting into practice the principles, the copywriting principles that you just learned, and you're putting it into practice by drafting an email and then actually shipping it. And you might ship 10 of these and see, you know, how many, what's my response rate? What's my conversion rate? So it's much more about the hands-on doing. I have something that I call the learn-do cycle, that in the past, learning was learn, 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 do. Whereas hmm. now, learning is about learn, do, learn, do, learn, do. And it's this cycle where you're learning something and then putting into practice and doing, and then switching back to learning, switching back to doing. And this back and forth switching makes lessons stick much more with learners. Oh, I love that. I think that's so smart. And I mean, really, it's like in the implementation that you really get the work that helps solidify what you've learned, but it also teaches you a lot. So it's like such a more rich experience. I want to know, are there certain topics that work really well for this structure of online learning? Or could this be applied across the board? What do you think about that? We're seeing courses across the board. So a lot of our earlier courses were in the business strategy startup realm. But now we have courses ranging from watercolor painting to crypto, to leadership and management, to yoga, to plant care, 
to coding. So any topic that benefits from interacting with material Mm -hmm. and working with a group of other people in your field really lends itself well to core-based courses, which I think is pretty much every topic. (laughs) I love that. I think that's so interesting. One thing I'm curious about is like, how has this idea evolved? So you guys were ahead of your time. You know, when you said like looking back now, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. How has your ability to approach this evolved over the last five, six, seven years? And what are the lessons you've learned? I have to imagine that after the last few years we've been through where so many things have shifted to online and people are way more used to learning online, this only helps solidify this idea of cohort-based learning. Walk me through the evolution from when you guys started this idea to where you are today. Back in 2015, the idea of cohort-based learning was so new that we didn't even have a name for it yet. (laughs) <laughs> so so that's that's how early we were. Gog and Biani, my co-founder and CEO, and I came up with the name cohort-based courses when we started working together about this time last year. So, you know, in the last five and six years, there's been so much growth in this category. And I expect in the next five to ten years, there's going to be an exponential curve here with the number of core-based courses that instructors and creators are launching. I think one of the reasons for that is creators are starting to see that cohort-based courses are a format that is within their grasp. You know, before with the Alt MBA and even after leaving the Alt MBA, when I was working directly with a bunch of other creators to build their schools and their courses, I was working with Professor Scott Galloway from NYU Stern at Section 4. I was working with the co-founders of Morning Brew. I was working with David Perel from Rite of Passage. And all of these creators were people who had reached a decent level of success online and had the resources to invest in either a team or support for running their courses. And it it dawned on me that there were a whole cadre of creators who could teach what they love online, but weren't able to do so because they didn't have the budget to hire a team or they didn't have you know, the resources to be able to hire support in the way that my clients were able to do. So that was one of the big points of inspiration for starting Maven was saying, you know what, even for people with big teams, the process for creating a course is pretty labor intensive. You know, We were cobbling together a bunch of free or low cost tools ranging from Zoom to Slack to Circle, Mighty, Harpy Chat, email, using Zapier to connect everything. You know, and I'd spent more than one night staying up trying to troubleshoot why a zap suddenly stopped working for no reason. You know, and when you're using so many different tools just to make something work, just to make your course work, there's just so much more room for error and for things breaking and just a convoluted mess. And, you know, that's not what creators are best at. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be messing around with the technology. They want to connect with their audience. They want to build their community. They want to teach on a topic that they're excited about. And so with Maven, Gog and I wanted to create an all-in-one spot where any creator could, with a click of a few buttons, start building their course, have everything that they need in one place, and be able to offer their students a better experience where you know their students could log into a student portal and be able to see everything that they need in one place. Wow, that's amazing. One thing I'm curious about is let's say somebody is a course creator and they want to infuse a little bit of this cohort, like dip their toe in the water of cohort style learning. What's the easiest way to start introducing this idea to hopefully help customer retention, but also results? And where would you begin with that? We always have our first time course creators do a survey with their audience to get a sense of who's excited to take your course. And the reason you want to do that is because thinking about course market fit from day one ensures that you don't spend three months building this huge course and you end up publishing it and no one signs up. I think that's a pretty valid fear for a lot of creators. And so what you want to do is tighten that feedback loop. 
So do a survey to your audience, whether it's your email list, social media, calling some of your current clients and saying, hey, I'm thinking about doing this one week course. It's going to be priced at this amount and we're going to meet on these days. And the goal is that you're going to leave this course with this outcome. What do you think? If you're excited, let me know, sign up for this waitlist. And you know, if I hit a certain number on my waitlist, then I'll go ahead and open this course. Hmm, so we have all of our creators who apply to, to come on to Maven, do this exercise. And we've heard amazing results, even from experienced course creators and experienced content creators. So Pomp, for example, Anthony Pompliano, he has a million followers literally on Twitter and he has a crypto course. And so Pomp is pretty familiar with who his audience is and what they're about. He has a podcast, he has a newsletter, he tweets all the time. So he's a pretty prolific content creator. And he started building his course. And a couple of weeks in, he was he was one of our first creators. We thought, okay, let's gut check with your audience to make sure that this course is going in the direction that you want to go in. So he did this survey with his audience. And he had thought that his students would be crypto beginners. But it turns out that all the people who signed up for his wait list, who were excited about his course, self-diagnosed as intermediate to advanced in crypto. So based on this information, he changed his curriculum. He changed maybe 50% of his curriculum to adjust it now that he knew, okay, actually my students are advanced. So I can trim a lot of the more beginner stuff and really dive in deeper into these areas that are that they're excited about. And so when we saw that, it was a, a light bulb moment where we thought, okay, even for an experienced content creator like Pomp, surveying your audience and getting a sense of what your students actually want to learn from you is really helpful. So that's when we asked all of the instructors who are interested in Maven to do this survey. And we've had really, really great feedback from instructors hearing from their audience and getting pre-signups on their course from surveying their audience. Mm. I love that because it's like a very low risk way to test out an idea and to get feedback where I think a lot of times creators just make assumptions where they're like, this is what my people want, or I'm sure people would be super pumped about this. And one of the things I, I feel like we forget is that certain things that we place value on as creators might not be as valuable to the consumers. And so you want to make sure that you understand exactly what they want and need. And I love that survey piece that makes it super low risk. So you don't have to follow through if it's not the right move or if you don't have enough interest, kind of protects you while also gives you the data that you need to move forward with confidence. Exactly. I love that. So I'm curious, what are the most common fears or mindset blocks around creating a cohort-based course? And how do you recommend overcoming those? I can already hear people's objections of, you know, I don't have more time. I'm worried that I can't facilitate. What if the internet breaks? Walk me through some of those mindset blocks and then how we can dispel those myths. Yeah, you hit on some good ones earlier. One of the ones that you'd mentioned was the amount of time it would take to build a course. Yes. And and creators just thinking, you know, this has got to be a huge lift. What do I do? You know, I want that Seth Godin style where, you know, it's super highly leveraged like we did in the Alt MBA. So, that's definitely something that I hear a lot. And, you know, one of the best things about a core-based course is that 80% of the effort in creating a course is upfront. So once you create the baseline course and you have your curriculum, every time that you want to run it thereafter, that's that 20% piece. So there is still some effort because you have to show up, but the majority of the work is done. So I think that that's a really different approach, a different, a different dynamic than a lot of other content that creators do. So you know, both Pomp and Lenny Rachitsky, who's another one of our instructors, he was an early product manager at Airbnb and now makes a living writing his Substack newsletter. Both Lenny and Pomp have talked about how they have to constantly feed the content monster. So mm. they're both obliged to publish weekly newsletters, to publish a certain set of podcast episodes. And they're constantly chasing this content. And if they don't, if they don't work on content for a week, then they're behind. Wow. And the reason they were excited to create a core-based course was because they saw this as an opportunity to create an asset that they could use over and over 
for years. So if you think about, you know, on the one end of the spectrum, it might be a self-paced course, a Udemy course. And on the far end of the other spectrum, it's, you know, content that you're having to create every single week. If you don't create it, it doesn't get published. Core-based courses are somewhere in the middle. And the reason that they are so appealing for a lot of instructors is because you have the scale of something like an evergreen course but you're able to charge the premium price points of something that is much more one-to-one. So with a Udemy course, for example, you might be charging $30, let's say 30, 50, $60 for a seat in your Udemy course. But with a core-based course, the average prices range from $500 per student to $5,000 per student. And the average that we've seen a lot on Maven is 750 to 1,000 to up to 1,500 are all really common price points. So you're literally able to charge anywhere between 10 to 100 times more per person. And what that enables is a creator doesn't have to chase volume. If you can charge a higher price point, you can have a cohort with 15 people in it, with 20 people, 30 people. Whereas if you were trying to make a living off of a Udemy course, you can't just have 30. Like Mm -hmm. that's just not enough money, right? You have to have a huge volume of students taking your course every year. Whereas with the core-based course, you have the flexibility to cater to your diehard fans, the core of your community, and offer something that is charged at a higher price point, but where you can have a smaller group of people who are really committed to being there. So Mm -hmm. for a lot of creators, even though they have to put in that upfront work to create the course, they're making literally $100,000 for teaching for two weeks. We've had over 10 instructors already. It hasn't even been a year of running Maven. We're still pre-product. And we've already had 10 instructors make over $100,000 teaching a core-based course. And we've had about 30 creators make over $10,000, again, teaching from anywhere between a few days to a couple weeks. So the amount of money that you can earn as a creator teaching core-based courses really opens up a whole world of opportunity and leverage for creators so that you don't have to constantly be either chasing content or chasing volume. I love that. And I think too, it's like, you can look at it in different ways. You could either have something automated where it's running, but you're making less, or you could put your energy into something for a few weeks or even a month and get bigger results and also get your students bigger results as well, which I think is super cool. Exactly. Exactly. I, I want to know, Wes, what is something that is exciting you right now? What is something that you are happy about or that is motivating you to show up? I feel like the world just needs a little spark of joy. And I want to know what's bringing that to you these days. Okay. So I'll do a work one and a non-work one. Perfect. Okay. So work one, we are in the middle of the Maven course accelerator. So this is a three-week cohort-based course that I teach. And this is this is free for all creators and instructors who are interested in Maven. And basically, we teach you everything that you need to know end-to-end on how to create a core-based course, from putting together your content and curriculum, to marketing your course, to writing your landing page, to hiring coaches and facilitators for your course. It's completely end-to-end, completely free. And we're in, we just kicked off the second week of the course, and we have 150 instructors and just seeing people on Zoom seeing instructors chiming in in the breakouts, talking in chat. You know, we're meeting twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's just absolutely incredible. And it inspires me so much to see all of these amazing creators building courses on a bunch of different topics that are going to launch in the next couple months. So that's really exciting. Main course accelerator. So that's the work one. In terms of a personal one, I am obsessed with plants. So if if our video were on now, you'd see some of my (laughs) plant babies in the background. I have 80 some plants all over my house. And I recently potted some cuttings that had grown roots. I transferred them from living in water to living in soil. And a lot of those cuttings are doing well. Sometimes when you transplant from water to soil, there's a chance that the plant doesn't survive or, or it gets weakened because 
nitty gritty, but basically soil roots are different from water roots. So plants actually have to grow a, a different set of roots when they're planted in soil. And there's just always a chance when there's that transplanting happening that that the plant, you know, loses some leaves or struggles to adapt. But a bunch of my cuttings that I recently made the switch are doing really well. So Love that's giving that. me life. Oh my gosh. Funny story. (laughs) My daughter is in Montessori school and they each had to bring their own plant into the classroom. Oh my gosh. There's like 30 little plants and she's three and she, they have to water their plants. So the teacher was like, please bring plants that can accept a lot of water because these kids get really excited. But now she goes around our house every day and wants to water because we have like 20 plants and it's just so funny to watch her take care of them and understand them. And I just think what a cool lesson, like for kids, how cool to see them grow. I love plants too. And I get so nervous to like transfer anything or like throw anything off. I get really Mm -hmm. nervous. So I'm very (laughs) proud of you for making those moves because I am not great at that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Wes, where can everybody find you and connect with you and learn more about what you're doing and learn more about cohort-based education? Give me all the places. Yes. So Maven is at maven.com. We're also on Twitter at mavenhq. And I'm at westko.com. And my Twitter is wes underscore ko. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. This is such an interesting topic and something we've never covered in the zone of digital courses. And so I think it's so eye-opening, so inspiring. And it's also really exciting to think about how we can get other people even greater results. So thank you for shedding a light on this for us today. Thanks so much, Jenna. This was so fascinating to me. As a course creator, one of the things that we obsess over is making sure that our students stay on track, complete the content, get their questions answered, and find community. I love how Wes combined these different styles of learning to help facilitate greater results. And I love how she's taken every step of her career and the knowledge that has come with it and applied it to what she is doing today with Maven. This episode hopefully inspired you either as a student or as an educator yourself to really focus on implementation, not just passively learning, but doing and trying and testing and experimenting. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com.